You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction, so stay together, both outwardly and inwardly, with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You have one body and one Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permitted with oneness, but that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. Hey, Mountain Road people, Ben here to give a special encouragement to you as we gear up for a super exciting fall here at Mountain. A lot's going on. Stay involved with the website and listen to what's going on each weekend because you're not going to want to miss what's happening. So much cool happening. Did you know last weekend I had a Welcome to Mountain class, over 100 people, so many jumped into new groups, started serving. We had over 20 baptisms. At Collide last weekend, we had a baptism, and it just is so cool to see a young person, a high schooler, on a path for Jesus. Hey, kids, all kids, you, when you go back to school here this week, or you've already been back, keep your feet following Jesus. Put him first. Hey, um, next week, we have a special message called Touch. It's going to be very important. And then the week after that, we start a new series called God's Frat Party. It's going to be really fun, but really important. A fresh look at what is the church and how do we live a Christian life, whether you're brand new to this or whether you're a veteran who needs a refresh in your faith. So invite your friends, bring them back to Mountain Road or any of our campuses for that matter, and we'll see you next week. Right now I want to introduce to you our guest speaker for the day, Sean Palmer. Uh, Sean is the lead minister at the Vine Church in Temple, Texas. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Abilene Christian University. He served for a while in California. What I love there is he was super involved with the church and the community and helping them work together on so many things. Sean's a gifted writer. He's all over the internet. He blogs. He's got a new book coming out next year called Unarmed Empire. And I absolutely love Sean's vision statement. It goes this, to help us all reimagine the church as a beloved community of hospitality and reconciliation so that all people can experience the embrace of God. Man, I love that vision statement. That's one I would give my life to. He and his wife, Rochelle, and their two kids have done exactly that. So I'm really glad he's here to share some of it with you. We've had a chance to work together uh, the last year or two on some race and reconciliation summits. And as we've become friends, one of the things I just deeply appreciate about him is his deep biblical thoughtfulness. He's just careful and clear, and yet he can be very strong and say some things that are not always easy to hear, but always in love. I know you're going to appreciate him. So, hey, Mountain Road, will you give a big, huge mountain welcome to our friend and our guest speaker to wrap up our Under Our Skin series, Sean Palmer. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I, I, I'm going to have Ben write down that introduction and give it to my wife so she will always know exactly what to say. <laughs> give it to my daughters, too. Like, this is how you introduce me. My oldest is 12, and I feel very much like when she introduces me to people, it's just that guy who drove me here. So I'm going to have her... Give, give that to everybody that she knows. But I'm excited to be here with you, uh, especially to talk about this subject at this time. And I want to thank Ben for leading the way on that because I don't know if you have felt it, but it's an incredibly difficult subject. This, this idea of race and division, disunity, is an incredibly difficult subject to talk about. The truth is that not very many people want to talk about it. It's not that pleasant. And it feels like there's not a whole lot of reward for when you do. I mean, there are often times, I think you probably feel the same way I do, that you worry that you're going to say something wrong, uh, say something inappropriate, something offensive. And there are some times where there's a part of you that really wants to say something offensive and wants to say something wrong. So, and so just to bring up the topic and talk about it in real and healing and humanizing ways is something that takes a lot of courage to do. And so you ought to be applauded for that and stepping into that arena. 
and trying to see what it is that God is calling us all to as his people in his kingdom. I want to tell you a little bit about an incredible experience I had last summer. Last summer, I took a civil rights bus tour with 19 other pastors. And what we did was we toured around the South to locations that had been very important to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. What was unique about this trip is that 10 of us were African American and 10 of us were Caucasians. And we were on this bus for five days together. It was all very Remember the Titans. (laughs) And we're visiting these sites together and seeing what it is that we can learn from one another and learn from our history. Because you know as well as I do that we live in a time, and maybe people have always lived in times, where it's so much easier to be divided than it is to be united. And that's just the world we live in. We live in a world that is very active in tearing each other apart, a world in so many ways that is ripping at the seams. And this isn't very new. I want to introduce you to a historical figure that you might not know. His name is Medgar Evers. On June 12, 1963, Medgar Evers was returning to his home from a meeting of the NAACP in Jackson, Mississippi. That very night, President Kennedy had given a national address on civil rights, and there was an emergency meeting at the NAACP in Jackson, and Medgar Evers was an officer in that organization at the time. And as he arrived home, he went around to the back of his car to unload a box from the trunk. It was a box of T-shirts. And on each T-shirt, it said, Jim Crow must go. And at the moment that Medgar Evers was unloading this box of T-shirts from his trunk, he was shot and killed by an Anfield rifle shot by a man named Byron De La Beckwith, who was across the street in hiding. Medgar Evers stumbled for about 20 feet before he collapsed. His wife had heard the shots, so she gathered herself and she gathered him and rushed him to the closest hospital. And when he got there, he was denied admittance because Medgar Evers was black. It was only until they discovered who he was, that he was a prominent member of the local African-American community, that he was admitted to the hospital, but it was too late. 50 minutes after Medgar Evers was shot, he died in Jackson, Mississippi. He was shot in his driveway. That's a driveway that my father knew well, because my father was in the seventh grade, and he was Medgar Evers' paper boy. Just two weeks before, Some white supremacists had tried to burn down his house. They threw a Molotov cocktail into his house. And you can still see to this day the singe marks on the house. And that's the world we live in. And I know it's very easy for us to believe that things like that were 50 years ago, but we really don't believe it when we think about it because all you have to do is watch your local news or read the headlines of American news or world news, and you know that's the exact same world that we live in today. And so the 20 of us were on this bus tour because we all really believe, all deeply believe, that at the heart of the Christian story, at the heart of the Christian gospel, is this call to healing and reconciliation for all people. And so what I want to do today is just walk us all through the grand sweep of the Bible to look at the entire thing and the story that God is telling. And so just for a few minutes, we're going to look at the entire story of the Bible. And to do that in the time that we have left, I'm going to have to skip a few details. (laughs) The first story of murder in the Bible is Cain and Abel. Cain rises up and he kills his brother Abel. And then, like his father before him, he tries to go into hiding. And as interesting as that story is, that first murder, what's more interesting to me is how we are introduced to Cain and Abel. This is how Genesis tells the story. It says, now Cain worked the fields, and Abel tended the sheep. When we first meet Cain and Abel, 
we are introduced to them by their differences, by what it is that makes them different. But when we first meet Adam and Eve, their parents, we are introduced to them by their similarities. Eve is literally made up of the same stuff that Adam is made up of. Where where the scriptures tell us that Adam is made from the dust of the earth, Eve is made from Adam. They are more alike than they are different. And right there, from the beginning of the story with Cain and Abel, we see the power of sin in the world. That one of the first things that sin does when it comes into our world is that it divides people. And we are then known by our differences. And sin always divides. The the Bible doesn't start with the creation of one great race. But sin likes to divide on race and gender and economics, but we're so used to it, we no longer even see it anymore. The Bible doesn't begin with the creation of one special race. Adam and Eve are not black or white or Asian or Latino. They're not even Jewish. God creates this man, and his name is Adam, which just means humankind. And Eve's name isn't really even Eve. It's Adam Ah. It's just the feminine, feminine ending of the name Adam. They are both just humankind. And when they step into the story, when the Bible opens, it is about creatures, it is about beings that are terribly similar to one another. And we don't even hear about differences among people until we get to the Tower of Babel. But in the very next book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, There comes a man who is named Moses, and Moses is considered the greatest spiritual leader of the Jewish people ever. And Moses leads his people out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God, but Moses has one thing that his sister Miriam has a problem with. Moses has married a woman named Zipporah, and Zipporah is a Cushite. And the Hebrew word Cush means black. And so what happens is that Miriam begins to grumble and complain against the marriage because she doesn't like the fact that her brother Moses is married to this Cushite woman. But it's not only that she's Cushite. That's part of the story. Because if Moses is the greatest leader in Israel, then Zipporah, this Cushite woman, is the most prominent woman in Israel. And Miriam thinks that really ought to be her. And so whenever we see divisions among race and races and there is grumbling and complaining about those people, behind the scenes, there is always a lingering desire for power. And so God decides that he's going to teach Miriam a lesson, so he gives her leprosy. And it turns her skin completely white. And theologians throughout the years have called this the curse of whiteness. And you just do with that what you want. (laughs) But this thing that Miriam does, this thing is deeply hidden in the human heart because we are talking about a group of people who have just been freed from race-based slavery in Egypt, and Miriam turns around and visits the same discrimination against Moses' wife. It's not just that some people have this. It's that all people have this. That every one of us has something deeply embedded in us that makes us identify the enemy, even when they're really not. But amongst the Hebrews, amongst the Israelites, it goes deeper than Miriam. Soon the Israelites begin to have trouble, not just with people who are outside of Israel, but people who are inside. They have trouble with people who aren't from the same tribe of them. 
So in Judges 12, you have two tribes. You have the people of Gilead and the Ephraimites. And they don't like each other very much. So the Ephraimites decide that what they're going to do is they're going to make sure that none of the people from Gilead have any dealings with any of their people. And so they decide that they're going to set up gatekeepers. And they're not going to let any of those folks come into their gate. But since they're all Jews, they all look alike. You can't tell who's who and who's from what tribe. And then Gilead remembers that those Ephraimites, they have an accent. And we don't want people with funny accents around here. And there's this one word that they can't say. This word, shibboleth. And this is how Judges 12 tells the story. It says, the men of Gilead captured the fords in the Jordan that led to Ephraim. Whenever a surviving Ephraimite asked to cross over, the men of Gilead would ask, are you from Ephraim? If the man said no, they told him, all right, say shibboleth. And if he said, sibboleth, They took him and killed him, for he could not pronounce it correctly, betraying that he was from Ephraim. So there at the fords of the Jordan, 42,000 Ephraimites were killed in those days. 42,000. That's a holocaust. But the story doesn't end there. The entire book of Jonah is really not about a whale. (laughs) It's about this guy named Jonah who's a prophet of God, and God says, what I want you to do is go over to Nineveh and tell the Ninevites about God's love and forgiveness and acceptance and embrace, and Jonah doesn't want to go. And it's not because Jonah doesn't believe in God's forgiveness. It's because he does believe in God's forgiveness. And he doesn't want God's forgiveness for those people. He doesn't want those people in the same community of God, in the kingdom of God, alongside with him. So God says go there, and Jonah goes a different direction. Jonah is the prophet of God. And he is the most racist person in the story. And he's actually mad at God, even at the end of the book. Because God loves people that Jonah doesn't want God to love. One of my favorite authors is Anne Lamott. And she says, you can safely assume that you have made God into your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people as you. (laughs) And so with this being the backstory, it's no wonder that when Jesus comes along, his very first sermon is about this very thing. Jesus begins his ministry in Luke 4 with a sermon, and this is what he says. But face the truth, hometowns always reject their homegrown prophets. Think back to the prophet Elijah. There were many needy Jewish widows in his homeland Israel, when a terrible famine persisted there for three and a half years. Yet the only widow God sent Elijah to help was an outsider from Zarephath in Sidon. In the same way with the prophet Elisha, there were many Jewish lepers in his homeland, but the only one he healed, Naaman, was an outsider from Syria. The people in the synagogue became furious when he said these things. They seized Jesus, took him to the edge of town, and pushed him right to the edge of the cliff on which which the city was built. They would have pushed him off and killed him, but he passed through the crowd and went on his way. And Jesus is just one of those old school prophets who believes that, I guess if they're not trying to kill you, then you must be doing something wrong. Because Jesus begins his ministry talking about one thing, that outsiders and insiders can come and worship and be together under the banner of Christ. And when you start to read Jesus' stories, every story that infuriated the Pharisees, every story that fueled opposition to Jesus was about this very thing, 
So one of the most famous stories that almost everybody knows from Jesus is the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus tells this story about a Samaritan, and when he says it, when he tells the story, the Samaritan is a hero. And so if you haven't read the story from Luke 10, what happens is very simple. Jesus tells a story about a man who is beaten unconscious. He's robbed and he's stripped naked and just left for dead by the side of the road. And some very religious people come along, and they just walk right by him. But then a Samaritan happens upon him. And I want you to hear how Jesus tells this story. The man is beaten and left unconscious. He can't speak. There's no way to know if he has an accent or what language he speaks. He's left naked. So there's no cultural or religious boundary markers of clothing, no no sign of clothing to tell you how wealthy he is. The Samaritan man happens upon him, and he doesn't know if he's a Jew or a Roman or a Samaritan or whatever. He's just a man by the side of the road, and it is this Samaritan who looks on him and has compassion and cares for someone regardless of who he is or where he comes from. And Jesus says, this is how you know if someone is a person of God. And he has this question for the scholars. Which of these three proved himself to be a neighbor to the man mugged by the robbers? And the scholar says, the one who showed mercy to him. He can't even say the word Samaritan. And there's another time In John 8, when Jesus has been teaching, and religious leaders are accusing Jesus of all sorts of things. So they come to Jesus, and they want to know whether Jesus is demon-possessed and a Samaritan. And so this is what they ask. They say, were we right? We were right when we called you a demon-possessed Samaritan. And Jesus says, I'm not taken by demons. You dishonor me, but I give all glory and honor to the Father. I just love the way they phrase this question. It's like, yeah, aren't you demon-possessed and a Samaritan? Kind of like someone coming up to you so casually, like, hey, is that your car that's got the lights on? They just ask it like it's, not, like it's nothing, like everything's just going to be fine, like this is a casual question. But asking Jesus if he is a Samaritan isn't really a question. It's an applause line. But Jesus doesn't play along. He he doesn't go along with the idea that being a Samaritan would somehow be second class or somehow be worse, that there was something inherently bad about being a Samaritan. Jesus just says, I'm not demon-possessed. That he's not even going to play that game and cooperate with him. And then later when Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem. And even though this is the very thing that is the final straw for the Sanhedrin and for the Pharisees, Jesus goes into the temple and cleans out the temple from the money changers. And and what you need to know about this story is that when Jesus goes into the temple and he clears out and overturns all of those tables, he's in a part of the temple which is known as the courthouse of the Gentiles. And so Passover's coming up, and what is happening is that people from all over the world are coming to Jerusalem for Passover. But when you're traveling from far away to worship at Passover, because people who are not Jews have always worshiped Yahweh, when you come that far, you don't bring everything with you that you need to worship. You don't bring lambs, and you don't bring doves. It's just too cumbersome. So you buy all of that when you get there at the temple. And what the Jews had done is they had set up a system where they were gouging Gentiles who were coming to worship God. And so the thing that Jesus is doing when he comes into the court of the Gentiles is he is saying that you will not take advantage of outsiders. It's the very same thing that God told the Israelites when they left Egypt and all of those Egyptians went with them, that you're going to treat the people who are not you just like you would treat the people who are you. And that's what sets Jesus off that he clears out the temple. And then he says this, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer 
for all people. But you have turned this house of prayer into a den of robbers. And Jesus says this place, this thing that we do as the people of God, this is for all people. The word there is translated in most of your Bibles, nations. Nations comes from this Greek word, ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnicities from. That this house is supposed to be a house for all the nations. And Abraham was supposed to be the father of all the nations. But he wasn't. And God was supposed to be the God of all the nations. But he wasn't. And he wasn't for one simple reason. The people of God did not know their own story. The people of God, when they opened up their Bible, they did not realize because they were so concerned with their own power, they were so concerned with their own status, they were so concerned with being right, they were so concerned with the works of Torah and then being right in the eyes of God, and they were so concerned with keeping other people out that they did not fundamentally understand their own story, and this is the story that God has always been doing. God wasn't the God of all nations. Not until Jesus Not until Jesus comes and is crucified and the veil in the temple, the curtain is torn. And that is the act that changes the world because from that very moment, everything is different than it's always ever been. Until Jesus is killed, no one cared. And I know that we're in the 21st century and we think that we're so smart and sophisticated now. And and we talk about things like racism and sexism. We talk about things like xenophobia all of the time. You can't get away from those subjects. But one of the things that we never talk about is why. Why should we be bothered by racism or sexism? Why do we care about any of those things? Because when you look at the grand sweep of the Bible and when you look at all of human history, you will notice one thing, that until Jesus, nobody cared about any of it. And with the death of Jesus, something is unlocked in the universe where God says to people, now you will be concerned about the thing that I have always been concerned about because no one in history except for God through telling his story has ever been concerned about insiders and outsiders living together as one new creation. God's the only one who seems to have a problem with it. And the cross changes everything. And after Jesus is killed and raised from the dead, there's another Jewish leader who rises up. His name is Saul. And Saul is virtually the Jewish ISIS of his day. That if you don't believe what he believes, if you don't practice what he practices, the best thing for you in his mind is for you to be killed. But he has this conversion. But he doesn't have a conversion by reading a book or going to a seminar or being part of a conference. He has this encounter with the risen Jesus, and he decides right there in this encounter that the way that he has seen the world is completely wrong. And so Paul goes away for about 14 years, and what does he do for 14 years? He sits in a dark room someplace reading the Old Testament over and over and over again, and he comes to the conclusion that God had come to long time ago, that the people of God had forgotten their story, and this has always been about everyone coming together as one new creation. And so Paul goes to the church in Jerusalem, and he says, I got an idea, because most of the Jews are scared of me anyway, I'm going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so every letter that he writes, every sermon that he gives, at the heart of it has this one central idea that those of you who are far off can now be allowed in, that through the vindication of Jesus as God's true son, that everyone everywhere has access to salvation through the God of Israel. And this has always been the story. 
It has always been the story that God's people were to be the preview, the trailer of what it will be like in heaven where every person, every man, woman, and child that has ever been born, no matter where you're from or what you've done, no matter what your background is, can worship as one new creation. And if you're here this morning and you are not a Jew, the only reason that you're here this morning is because a man named Paul took the gospel outside of a 30-mile radius of Judea and said that you could come in. And that's the story of the church because it's the story of God. And it has always been the story of God and we have missed our story because when you begin to talk about these sorts of things that matter very deeply, so many of us wanna say, well, that's kind of a nice thing to do. That's kind of adjacent to the gospel. But when you read the Bible, you will see that this is the story. That the central idea that Paul deals with in every single letter that he writes is that Jew and Gentile can come together. And this is why he says crazy things like, man, that we are all one, slave, free, male, female, that there is no Jew, there is no Greek. This is the story of Scripture. And it is the central task of the church to create one new creation under God. And Paul has this encounter with Jesus. And he discovers that the way he has seen himself and the way that he has seen other people is completely wrong. That he had spent his life classifying this group of people as that and these other folks as that over there and he's this and this is better than that or that and he decides because he meets Jesus that he's been wrong all the time. And I love the way that he talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, because of all that God has done, we now have a new perspective. We used to show regard for people based on worldly standards and interest. No longer. I like how the NRSV puts it when it says, we no longer see anyone from a worldly point of view. And I'm gonna tell you the truth, church. No matter what perspective you come from, no matter what your story is, and when you turn on news, when you read the newspaper, if you are getting your view of who other people are from the people on the news, you are seeing others from a worldly point of view. That the voices that we listen to in our culture are not concerned with the things that God is concerned about. So when we spout off and we want to quote our favorite talking head or our favorite writer on this subject or that subject, when we have an opinion about something very powerful and important and we haven't talked to God first, we have a worldly point of view. And the entire point of the ministry of the Apostle Peter is that we will no longer see one another that way. And this is why he says in Ephesians 2 that because of the death of Jesus, the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down between us. That this, this is the gospel. And so last year, I asked our church to do something. The church where I pastor in Texas is actually predominantly white. And the truth is that most of us, for lots of different reasons, don't know a lot of different people who aren't like us. And so we asked everyone in the church, just during a particular season of our life together, that what we wanted to do is we wanted to invite people into our home for a meal who were very much unlike us. 
So it didn't matter whoever you were, if you were African American, you could find uh, an Asian family or a family that maybe uh, migrated up from Mexico, you could find a Caucasian family. If you were elderly, you could even find someone who's very young. And we wanted them to sit around the table together and we gave them specific instructions and here what the instructions were. Ask a good question and shut up. And then we felt like they needed a little bit more guidance. So we said, when you're having these conversations in your home and, and someone says something that you don't like or that you disagree with, and you start to get all sort of bowed up, and we live in a world where everybody feels like everyone else is owed their opinion for some reason, um, that instead of giving them your opinion, you just say one sentence, tell me more. Because the dream of God has always been for all of his creation to gather around an open table and to be drawn together in the spirit of unity under the banner of Christ. So last year when we were on our civil rights bus tour, one of the places we stopped was a 16th Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. If you've seen the movie Selma, it begins telling the story of 16th Avenue Baptist Church where on September 16th, 1963, a bomb went off and killed four preteen girls. And there's a little monument there and we spent some time talking with people. There was a video that they showed of the current pastor who can't actually work at the church building because so many people come by. And one of the things that he says in the video that's always stuck with me is that we're not a museum, we're a church. And because they're a church, they are still actively involved in the healing and restoration of all things, the very same thing that God has always been involved in. And when you walk around that church, you begin to wonder, why would anyone bomb a church? Or like last summer, why would someone like Dylan Roof walk into Emmanuel AME Church and shoot and kill nine people in the middle of a prayer meeting? And the more you think about that, you realize that they got their target right. Because when you begin to think about dignity and freedom for all people, that has always and only been the story of the church. That this is the church's task, this is the church's call. And that from the very beginning, that God intended all of his creation to be one creation. And we've just forgotten our story. And one of the more fascinating pieces that you'll see there is the stained glass window of Jesus. And when the bomb went off, even though the bomb was only about 30 or 40 yards from the stained glass window, the window didn't break except for one part. Right in the middle, it blew out the face of Jesus. And it just left a little hole there, kind of like one of those cardboard cutouts that you might see at the state fair. And I was struck looking at it that that's about right too. Because whenever the forces of hatred and division, all of the forces that want to pull the world apart, when they rear their face, Jesus always turns his. And last year, I wrote an article for foxnews.com, and in that article, I made the simple argument that in our country, the greatest movements for healing, restoration, and justice have always begun in the church. Whether it's the civil rights movement or women's suffrage or the abolitionist movement, all of those movements began in the church. There's a man who lives in Alabama that we spend some time with. His name is Fred Gray. And Fred is in his 80s now, 
And he was the first attorney for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. And Fred, for his adult life, has not only been an attorney, he's also been a minister and an elder in the church. Do you realize that at the beginning of the civil rights movement, which basically began with the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted over a year, as men and women walked to church and walked to school and walked to work and to the grocery store for over a year, every night they gathered together for church. That those pictures that you see when you look back on the March on Washington and you see the men there in their coats and ties and women in nice dresses and they're walking along singing before those marches started, they gathered for church. The night Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed in Memphis, as he was walking out of his hotel room, he was straightening his tie because they were headed to church. King's last words were to the worship leader that night, a man named Ben Branch. He said, Ben, could you play Precious Lord, Take My Hand tonight? And could you play it real pretty? This is the church's work. And the solution to our problem did not start at a bus boycott in Montgomery, and it won't be solved at City Hall or the halls of Congress or the White House. This dream of God for one new creation began in a little tiny manger in Bethlehem where Jesus is surrounded by magi, sheep, shepherds, and family, foreigners, people of other races, his own family, and they all bow to worship God. It is the only thing that will save us. It is the only thing that can bring about the healing of the nations. Let me pray for us. God, would you give us hearts to share your vision of the world? And remind us that you are the father of all nations and that you seek to find a group of people who are willing to lay down their lives to be about your business in the world. Would you allow us to be stripped of our false selves, all of our ego and all of our power trips, all of our protection, all of the things in life, God, that only come from you, but somehow we feel like we have to scratch and claw to conserve. Give us a vision, God of who you are and what you've always been doing. But more than give us a vision, give us words to speak, give us feet that move, and give us hearts that act through the power of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen.